So thank you very much. Thanks, Federico, and thanks to the other organizers for, uh, for putting this together. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here and talk to such an uh, international audience. So if you have questions, please stop me, and, uh, and uh, we'll try to go through uh, the things once again. Uh, the, the topic is not so simple, so if you have any questions, uh, again, please stop me, and, and, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss. It's much better to have uh, an interactive discussion rather than just a, you know, a research seminar, which is uh, uh, sometimes not the, the best thing. Okay, so, um, so what I'm going to talk about today is I, I changed the title a little bit because uh, um, I'm going to talk about memory to set responses, but I can understand that maybe this is not a topic that uh, everybody manages uh, um, uh, in, a, in an easy way. So the, the first part is going to be technical, but not just in the specifics of flow, just how we push the technology uh, to, to its most advanced limit, and then the second part will be mostly on immunology. Um, and uh, so the title is uh, uh, Single Cell Profiling by 30 Parameter Facts. We have more answers with, with this technology, but at the same time we generate new questions and, uh, and we try to give some solutions to, to these questions. And this is the disclosure that uh, I want to give before starting. So why do we need more colors? Uh, uh, we need more colors, uh, I guess, for a simple reason. Because there's, at least in the immune system, there's hidden subsets that we cannot identify with otherwise with uh, other uh, technologies <coughs> or, or just by studying a few parameters. So this is an old uh, study that I did when I was a postdoc. We identified a memory population, a small memory population, memory CD80 cell population, that was hidden in the naive cells. So. Um, uh, it, this is a, a standard gating strategy to identify CD3 positive cells and then CD8 cells. And we uh, used up to seven different markers, the, 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 the most usual markers, uh, to identify highly purified naive cells. And inside the, that population, so a population of cells that has, ideally has never seen the antigen, there is a small population up here that we call memory stem cells which upregulates, uh, at a certain extent, uh, markers of memory. So, for example, CD95 is generally found on memory cells, and then, in fact, we uh, sorted that population, we did all kinds of different assays, and uh, we uh, have seen that, that those cells, even though they're very rare, they have memory functions. So they're hidden in the naive compartment, and you can do this, you can identify those only if you're doing single-cell analysis, otherwise bulk analysis will not give you uh, the, uh, the, any answer. So we place those cells in the differentiation uh, path of, of CD8 cells. So if you take uh, the, the naive cells, uh, those that have never seen the antigen, they are at the beginning of the immune response. Once you, ha you have an immune response, those cells proliferate, they generate progeny in the, uh, uh, of effector cells, and then according to the signals they receive, they can differentiate into multiple subsets of memory. And uh, this is the population that we identified. It was the earliest differentiated memory population identified thus far. And then you have the classical central memory cells defined by Federica Salusto and Antonio Lanzavecchia a while ago, and then a, a, a bunch of other subsets, transitional memory effector, memory terminal effectors. And you can identify those by using specific combination of markers, so positive and negative antigen expression. So what is the difference? Why do we want to subset so much? Uh, this is not just a game, it's something that we want to do because we know that different cells um, have different functions. So for example, if you take the early differentiated cells, they're going to have higher proliferation, stemness, long-term persistence. And this is what you need, for example, when you want to do adoptive transfer. In humans uh, or, or in mice, uh, to have a better anti-tumor immune response or antiviral immune response, you need these populations and not these. Uh, what is the functions of these? So they, they lose these capacities by acquiring others. So for example, cytotoxicity uh, is high in these populations, so they can kill very efficiently. The problem is that they don't kill for a long period of time. So if you want killing in the long term, you need to have something like this. If you want to kill fast, assuming that your tumor goes away very quickly or your virus goes away very quickly, then this is what you need. But in, in some cases, for example, for tumors, uh, uh, the, the immune response lasts uh, many weeks, and so if you use this, these populations, you're not going to have a, 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 a good effect. So um, when, I, uh, uh, when I started my, my lab in Milan, uh, we had the possibility then to invest on a, on a new technology, and uh, um, at the time we were able to do uh, at least 15, 20 parameters on single cells. 
And then uh, a new technology came out, like, like this one. Uh, so this is a, a, an instrument uh, 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 from, from Beckton Dickinson, the Symphony A5. It's also, uh, this is what we have, but there's also other instruments, like BioRat, uh, that, that can measure uh, up to 30 parameters. So uh, this instrument had the usual um, uh, uh, lasers, 405, 488, 561, and, and 640, and we added a, a, a UV laser, which was able to excite a, a bunch of new conjugates, uh, so uh, seven new conjugates that we could add to the array of the fluorocones that we could measure. And then other uh, synthetic uh, fluorocones, uh, uh, the so-called brilliant blue, uh, like this one is a brighter replacement for per CP555, which is a bit uh, weak. And then other molecules like BB480 or BB750, etc. So at some point, uh, this machine will be modified because we will be integrating new infrared and, and deep UV lasers. And there's already 10 to 15 fluorocones that are ready to be excited by these lasers and the idea is to jump from 30 to 45 or 50 parameters uh, very quickly and this is what is going to happen, I hope, what is going to happen in the next couple of years or so. So uh, you have talked about uh, compensation in, in the past days, you have talked about, about spreading error and uh, uh, generally the question that I have at this point is so if you put all these antigens together, all these uh, fluorocombs together, plus the, 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 the other 20s that you have in your array, you're going to have 30 parameters. So if you compensate, your compensation is going to be a kind of a nightmare, right? <laughs> so you're going to have like this kind of matrix, okay? This is 28 by 28 colors. <laughs> and, uh, and actually, it's, it's a bit complicated because you, you're, you have to check like every single uh, combination and that's uh, really undoable. So, um, I want to draw your attention on a combination, which is this one, BV480 and BV510. So these are two dyes excited by the violet laser, very close to each other, so just 30 nanometer difference in terms of detection. Uh, actually, BV480, uh, uh, BD cells, BV480 is a brighter replacement for BV510. So, they say, use one or the other. So, but we thought they're, they're, they're kind of separated, so if we design the uh, filters uh, that are uh, precise enough, ideally we should be able to split. Um, but if you check the compensation, I'm going to help you here, if you check the compensation between these two dyes, at least in this experiment, it was 385%. So that means that if you detect BV480 much better in this channel than in this channel, then it's, it, it's originally assigned channel. How is this possible? So uh, are we able to use these two dyes uh, together? And I'm going to show you that this is actually doable. Uh, the question is, do we really care about this thing? So is, is, is it very important to have a low compensation value? I don't know if they told you in this course that you should compensate the, uh, uh, the less possible to have... Okay, that's wrong. Forget it. It's, it's not correct. Um, sorry, I, I am a bit uh, uh, politically incorrect, but, but this, is, this is important. So don't care, you shouldn't care about this matrix. Okay? The only thing that you should care about is to check that you're compensating correctly, but don't care about the numbers. The numbers don't really mean anything, and we're going to see uh, that in a, uh, in a second. So this is a percentage. It means that we're, uh, uh, if 100% if, uh, uh, is the maximum that you can subtract, we're subtracting 3.8 3 times as much as, as we could subtract. But this is digital compensation, so ideally we could go up to 1,000, a million, and, and that doesn't really matter. Okay, so let's have, uh, uh, let's have uh, the example. BV480 and BV510 combination. <coughs> Here I said the compensation is more than 300%. Uh, I'm going to share this, so if you, there's, there's no need to, to take pictures, uh, you're going to have this afterwards. So the compensation is more than 300%, but uh, you have talked about spreading error, right? Okay, so in this case, the cells were stained with BV480, CD4, and, and, and BV510, uh, 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 sorry, uh, in uh, aqua, uh, which is uh, detected in, in, in this channel, the BV510 channel. And this is in the uncompensated space, and then you compensate, okay? And this is the spread that you have been talking about, okay? So the cells, the signal uh, spreads. It's not because of the compensation. The spread is there in the data before you compensate. So, but, but look at this. Even though you have more than 300% comp uh, compensation in this combination, you can clearly separate these signals. You can identify the single positive, the single positive here, the double positive, and the double negative. So it doesn't really matter if you have such a high value of compensation. That's not really important. 
Instead, if you have low spread, then you can, you can separate, okay? So I just want to show you another example, which is this one. So we use the uh, uh, two different dyes in this case. BV750P stands for prototype, but that's not important. And BV786. In this case, the compensation is only 41%, which you would say, okay, that's, that's fine. It's not that much. But look at this. So you stained for a single BV750, okay? So this is a single stain. And this is a single BV786, so we don't have anything in, in here and, and in here. But you see that, uh, that when you compensate, you see the spread in the data is so high that you can't really distinguish when you mix them together, the double positive population. So even though the compensation is low, the spread is so high that you cannot separate. Okay? So it's not important how much you compensate, but it's important uh, actually the spread in the data that you have. So what is this? You have, uh, you've gone through the, the spread a little bit, but we're going to touch this uh, uh, a little more because I think it's, it's, it's important. So we're talking about uh, spreading error in the multicolor world. So this is a joke just for the Italians, because I don't think that if, if you come from abroad, you understand. So what is the spread? So obviously, it's the difference between uh, the, 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 the BTP in Italy and the, and the German bonds, right? And uh, it was going down a few days ago, so that's good. And obviously, you can ask any of our politicians if you want to discuss about the spread. So our former and prime minister going. said, ah, that, that's, that's fine, you know, it's always fine. And then uh, uh, Mario Monti came and he said, it's blood and tears, and now we have these two guys. And, and this guy says, obviously, it's the EU, and, and, and this guy, yeah, whatever. <laughs> Everybody has his own opinion, more or less. Okay, so... So what happens when you have this, this spread? What happens in the data? So properly compensated. So uh, when you have good compensation, correct compensation, okay, not wrong compensation, but correct compensation, the data may not appear rectilinear because there is measurement errors. So the machine makes a mistake when it measures photons coming from given photons. Um, and, and this is more uh, uh, abundant when, when you have dyes like Psi 7 p Psi 7 apc Alexa 700, those dyes in the red infrared. So the reason is because if you go towards the red and the infrared, you're not going to have many photons because you're, you're, you're at the limit of the visible. If you don't have many photons, your measurement is not very precise. And so that's why the machine assigns a value to, to your fluorescence, which is a, a, a kind of spread out. And that's why you have this spread in the data. What is the problem here? That the measurement errors are directly proportional to the square root of the intensity. So the higher the signal, the higher the spread. Okay, so obviously you want to have bright signals, but you have to cope with, with, with this thing. And this effect, as I said, on compensated data is unavoidable, and it cannot be corrected. Uh, by compensation. It's intrinsic in the data before you compensate. And uh, this is just, a, um, uh, just an example. So for example, if you, if you take these cells uh, which are stained only with CD3 APC, and we're going to have, uh, we're looking at the, at the contribution of the spillover into the PSI7 channel. Um, this is single stain, okay? So in the PSI7 we don't have anything. Uh, you, you, the spread in the data in the uncompensated has uh, uh, like about a thousand channels of, of difference. You compensate and, and then you do the bi-exponential transformation to see whatever you have below the axis. And once you transform, you have this kind of thing. And this is what you generally see when you have the, the spread in the data. But when you measure, then the distribution of the data, it's always a thousand channels. Okay, so it was there before. It's not introduced by compensation. Don't think that if you compensate more, you're going to solve this. It's, it's not going to happen. You're just uh, creating problems. So if you, it, it's there in the data before we compensate, in the uncompensated space. So we can't really do anything. So is this a problem? In some cases, yes. In some others, no. So uh, if you design a panel where you have, let's say, two colors, okay, this one and, and something else in PE size 7, and you want to measure a second antigen, and your antigen in the, in, the, in, the second, in the second channel is bright enough, then it doesn't matter if you're detecting the, the single positive for PSI7 or the double positive, because they're so bright that they separate from this, okay? So this is the threshold for positivity for, for this population, and, and this one is, is, is for the other one. It's not a problem. You're going to detect 100% of the events in both cases. However, if you design a panel where your antigen in the PSI7 is not bright enough, 
just in this case, but not in this case. Okay, so if you're measuring this population, you're fine. But if you're measuring this one, you have a problem. Because, at least in this example, 50% of the events will be masqueraded, covered by, by the spread from the, other, from the other channel. So when you design a panel, you have to take these into consideration. And remember that you're doing multidimensional single cell measurements. So what you put here, if it is too bright, it's probably going to spread into a third channel or a fourth channel. And so you have to be careful of what you assign. And remember that you can have up to 28 different dimensions. So the, the complexity is not, is not, uh, it's not like, like easy. To, uh, it's not a, an, easy, an easy thing. It's a complex thing, but we can manage it. So for example, um, you can, instead of having a chart of, of compensation, which I said is not really important, you just have to check that you compensated correctly, but it's not very important. The, the numbers are not very important. You can draw a, a chart of spreads between channels, across channels. And this is 28 uh, dimensions and 28 dimensions. And so you're going to have some combinations that are fine, some that are critical, some that are very critical, and, and others that are really uh, kind of impossible. Um, so uh, this is just an example. We have a paper in press in Nature Protocols where we explain all these things in a very detailed manner. So it's going to come, come out, I guess, in, in a few weeks. Or so if, if, you, if you're interested, just check the, the journal and, and the paper will be there. It tells you on how to develop very complex panels to take these things into consideration. Uh, you have this chart, as Juzi said uh, yesterday, you can, you can take it and, and you don't have to learn it by heart. Just have it uh, uh, beside your computer and, and you can check it whenever you design a panel. So we put everything together and this is the complexity that, that, that we have. So uh, this is an n by n view of all possible combinations that you see that it's not very simple. So, but you have to go through every single combination just to, just to check that everything is fine. Um, and now we can have uh, 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 panels that can measure pretty much anything on, on, on single cells. We're interested in T cells, so we look at cytokines, polyfunctionality, differentiation, uh, activation, exhaustion, metabolism, tissue residency, residency, and whatever you can think about. Um, these panels are very flexible, so ideally you can put any, any, any type of antigen that, that you want. So um, now I, I want to discuss something about the data analysis because that's important and, uh, and uh, it's important to go through the reproducibility of, uh, of the data. Um, this is something that we, we came up with uh, when we started to, to look at, uh, at, these, at these data. So, um, uh, so we, we did an experiment in the very beginning where we took three LT individuals run over five different experiments. Okay, it's always the same individuals, always the same cells, but done in five independent experiments. Uh, and it was a 27 parameter panel. And we did uh, an analysis called TISNI that I think you have seen in, in publications, okay? So, um, with, with these parameters. So, it lo when you, when you, the output looks like this. So, TISNI takes the multidimensional data, so you have to think that every single cell is put in a, in a 28 color dimension, okay? So, it has 28 different dimensions wants to uh, reduce the dimensionality of the data to have uh, the data placed into a 2D graph. And the cells are stochastically distrib distributed in this 2D map according to their similarities and differences in the different uh, antigen expression, okay, the level of fluorescence. And this is a TISNI parameter 1 and TISNI parameter 2, so you have two dimensions and, and it's easier to see. So what we did in the very beginning was to have was to take cells from run the different the five different runs, which ideally should give exactly the same answer in terms of, of, of uh, measurements. But when we just draw a, an arbitrary gate into this region, we have 53 percent of the cells in here, which was quite reproducible in the second assay. Not very much in the third, in the fourth, and it was quite a disaster in, in, in the fifth. So how is this possible? Are are we measuring something? So what what is happening? during the five different experiments. And obviously, uh, there, there, there can be different possibilities. So we tested every single possibility and, and saw what was the problem. So possible sources of error, uh, obviously these could, could be technical versus computational. Okay, so you're screwing up your, your computational, uh, computational analysis or you're doing something wrong in sample preparation. 
So it could be instrument performance. Uh, the instrument does not perform the same from day to day, which is something we're, we're very uh, uh, um, uh, um, careful about. Batch effect, you stain today, you stain tomorrow, and you have a difference, just because it's, it's not the same experiment. Compensation and spreading error, we have talked about that. And the other thing we thought about was background fluorescence. And we're going to go through every single uh, uh, aspect. Uh, so this is the instrument performance. Whenever we do an experiment, before every experiment, we run a set of beats. So we check that the reproducibility of the machine is the same from day to day. I do an experiment today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, in a year, in 10 years. It's very reproducible, and we tested this. So uh, this was just in the case of this specific experiment. So you, if you take these five different runs, which were uh, like four weeks apart, okay, in, in the range of four weeks, this is the background, and this is the positive signal for uh, a number of different detectors. And you can see that these beads uh, fall exactly in the same place. Okay, so the, the instrument performance it's exactly the same from experiment to experiment. So the machine doesn't contribute to the difference. Uh, we just had a, a, a bit of increase in, in background here, probably do, I, I don't know for what, but, uh, but, but it's not the machine creating the, the problem. Um, so we checked, what we checked was then the positive signals and the negative signals. So if you, if you check your antibody performance, you can see if you have a, 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 a difference in, in, in the staining or, 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 uh, or in antigen expression. So but if you, uh, the interesting thing here, if you look at the positive antigens, like CD, uh, those that are positive, so CD73, CD45RA, uh, uh, CCR7, etc., you can see that there is very good reproducibility from, from day to day. So there's no difference from, from, uh, from the stainless. So the antibody performs correctly, and, and, and also we pipette it correctly. But I want to draw your attention on the fact that in the background, so for antigens that are negative, like CD25, CD69, Chi607, there is a difference on how the machine or how we, we obtain signals from, from background. Okay, so from uh, day to day, we have a difference in background which doesn't mean anything bi biologically. So if you have, let's say, a value of 1,000 here or, or zero, it's the same thing, because biologically that's negative. That antigen is not expressed. But you have a difference in the background on how the machine processes the, the, the background. And so if you plot these, if you take just the negative values, this is the threshold of positivity for these two, so it's D69 and D25, and you plot those values uh, against your your Tisney axis, your Tisney values, you can see that there is a sort of a, like a step that is introduced here by by the background, and that's the problem. So we have a difference in in background, so autofluorescence or uh, whatever you want to call it, which uh, generate introduces this this kind of, of thing, which is uh, like a like a, a, a different Tisney distribution. So ideally, you could think that you have a difference in the distribution of your cells, but actually biologically, it doesn't mean anything. So you have to be careful if you if you do these kinds of analysis. And the other problem was also the spreading error that we had. So this we designed a very simple panel where we had only one single. Uh, combination giving spread. In this case, it was BV605, CD57 into CCR7. So when you, whenever you have spread, your cells can go either up or down. Okay, And these are the cells that go up, and these are the cells that go down. And if you plot, uh, if, you, if you have a look at the, uh, uh, your, uh, your Tisney without this, this parameter, so you remove that, um, it, it looks like this. And you see these holes here indicated by the arrow. And then you overlay <coughs> Your positive, your your negative spread, it actually fills these holes. So it means that somehow we're creating new populations, which don't really have a meaning. But ideally, the Tisney identifies this difference. But this is a computational kind of drift that is introduced by 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 the nature of the data. So you have to be careful when you when you when you use these things. Um, are you a ghost in the machine. Huh? It, it's a ghost in the machine, right. Yeah, something like that. Okay? So, but uh, we introduced a solution, and that uh, solution is called bi-exponential transformation. So, the bi-exponential transformation takes the negative data and normalizes the distribution. 
so this is how it, 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 it appears before for this particular antigen. You have a bunch of data that is uh, uh, buried below the axis because we're working on a log scale. So everything below uh, 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 in the log scale, then you, have, you can have negative data. And this is how it looks like after transformation. And, uh, and uh, we tested that, so if you, if you take the round one and round five what, that you remember were very different from the very beginning. Um, and before transformation, they're still different because you have a lot of cells in, in, in this case here and a lot of cells in this case on, on the other side. Then you, you include that, uh, that bi-exponential transformation and they look pretty much the same, so the reproducibility actually is, is, is very good. So it was not a problem of reproducibility, or at least there is differences in the background which, which don't affect your data if you gate in a standard way, but if you use these, these tools, it can make a difference. So um, for CYTO, for single cell RNA sequencing, for example, other technologies that can measure many parameters at the level of single cells, you don't have this problem because in CYTO, you don't have autofluorescence, so it's very low autofluorescence. So the negative, well, let's say, what well, the biologically negative values are actually piled on, 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 the, on the channel zero, okay? So whatever is, is negative is zero and then it's positive. For single cell RNA sequencing, it's, it's the same. For facts, you have autofluorescence which can be different from cell to cell. But in this case, it's not a matter of, of a biologically different autofluorescence. The autofluorescence for lymphocytes is the same. It's just the fact that the machine processes the background in a, in a different way. So uh, what do we do? So uh, um, we, we, um, uh, the, the, the thing is that uh, this nature in the data actually generates new Disney islands that are not meaningful. So if you, if you take like, a, uh, like this uh, type of analysis and then you gate uh, according to, to these islands in the Disney, to, to, in my opinion, it's not very useful because you're going to analyze what this is arbitrary, so the subdivision is arbitrary just because the Disney separates uh, cells. And so you think that that's a different population. But that's not the case. So the, the good thing is not to use uh, the, 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 the take home method is don't use these for gating, just use them to, to uh, investigate your, your data and not, and not for identifying new population because otherwise you're going to be lost in the data again. Um, so now we're going through uh, uh, bioinformatic approaches that we use to, uh, uh, to identify new. Uh, Populations uh, uh, regarding the memory cells, which is you know the the, uh, the, the main topic of of, of uh, my talk. Yes. This one. It's a post-processing thing. So. Um, <coughs> So, in uh, if you um, so flow cytometry data generally displayed in log scale. So, uh, uh, whatever is is uh, below zero, uh, sorry, whatever is between zero and one in the linear scale, then becomes negative in the log scale, right? Okay, yeah. I wasn't very good at math, but this is what I remember. <laughs> no, I was a disaster. But so, yeah. Uh, now, now I, I speak like I am an expert, but, well, <laughs> but that's not true. Anyway, so uh, so and and uh, and uh, so you can go back to minus infinite, ideally, right? Because it's a it's a log it's a log scale. Uh, so if if you look at this, uh, I think this is like ten to the first or something. Oh, ten to the zero. Okay, so whatever is below uh, ten to the zero then is negative, and uh, and you cannot see it. So uh, uh, a while ago. Um, uh, a few people introduced what we call bi-exponential transformation or logical transformation can have different, uh, different names. Basically what they do is that they, they take the, the, the log values below zero and, and they, they transform the scale into a linear scale. And so when you have this display in the data, you have a transition in the bottom in the bottom part of the axis from a linear scale into a log scale, which is some, some uh, there is some kind of harmonization in, in, uh, in, in, uh, 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 at the time of, of this shift. So it looks like this. And uh, the negative values, whatever their distribution is, they're forced to appear in a Gaussian distribution, so they're normalized. 
And that's why if we have differences in, uh, in, uh, in negative values, then they're, they're kind of normalized. So the, the scale is transformed so you can see what is below zero, because otherwise you will never be able to see it, because it could go down to minus infinite. Is that clear? Just wondering, is it the same principle you use when you have to compare data from transitronic analysis to, to align different ones? That that I don't I don't think so no that I don't I don't think so uh, I should ask my bioinformaticians but uh, I I, I, so I think I can explain it very well. yeah so yeah and 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 that can influence uh, this the, this thing so if you if you transform it's pretty clear that then you have the, um, a, a very reproducible thing so analysis. Uh, problem. Um, so if we have a 25 color assay, we can ideally identify up to 20, uh, 2 to the 25th different subpopulations. And if we think about standard gating, standard gating is always biased. Because, let's say, the population I, to I told you in the very beginning, that, uh, that population we call stem cell life, it's, uh, it's always the same. It's always the same and it's RO negative, CCR7 positive, etc, etc, etc. Why is that? Because we defined it in that way, and if, some, if someone comes up with, with a new definition, it must be justified, etc., etc. But that population is defined in that way because we were the first to define it. But it doesn't necessarily mean that it's, it's the best possible way to identify, to identify that population. But remember, binary gate, we have a, a different levels of fluorescence. Binary gating is always uh, 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 is, is biased because we tend to define an expression of a given antigen in, in, in terms of positive and, and, and negative, okay? But it doesn't mean that cells that are positive are, are positive the same. They could be uh, uh, weakly positive or highly positive, so, and that can make a difference. So, for example, let's, say, let's, let's take a molecule which is uh, 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 very trendy at this time, PD-1, okay, targeted by cancer immunotherapy. If you take PD-1 positive cells, uh, people tend to, uh, to, to say that they're the same, but they're not. So the PD-1 intermediate, but not the PD-1 high, are actually the most uh, powerful in, in inducing uh, anti-tumor immune responses. So uh, a while ago we, we proposed, uh, it was more than 10 years ago, we proposed to use this approach called principal component analysis to reduce the dimensionality of the data. So basically principal component analysis takes uh, the multi-dimensional data and reduces it, like, like Disney, the principle is pretty much the same. Uh, reduces the dimensionality of the data set and then distributes samples or populations in a, in a, in a, in a 2D or 3D space in, the, space in this case by considering all the variables at the same time. And this was a very simple eight-color assay done, done more than 10 years ago where we analyzed uh, uh, people with different ages. So if you take the young individuals, the middle-aged individuals, and then the centenarians, so 100-year-old individuals, then you can see that in, in this graph they display in different areas and you can identify the specific phenotypes that are uh, important for, uh, uh, for that distribution. And for example, this one was naive cells, not very surprising, and these were some kinds of memory cells. Uh, but you see here that you have many different phenotypes and this is the antigen, uh, uh, the antigen order many different phenotypes that can characterize these individuals. And this one and this one, even though they, they, they have 100, year old, uh, 100 years old, they don't look like the same. So they have a different distribution for CDA cells. So uh, there's different <coughs> tools nowadays that we can use for analyzing data. Uh, there's a lot of bioinformatics going on. In particular, I want to uh, draw your attention on this one, Phenograph. Uh, this is the one that we use to dissect our, our very complex data set. So Phenograph is a clustering algorithm takes the single cell data uh, from the multidimensional space and then clusters the cells according to their similarities and differences. And then the output is a number of different clusters, we're going to see that in a second, a number of different clusters that have ideally differences at the level of antigen expression. So it, 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 it removes all the combinations that maybe are not important for, uh, for, uh, uh, for our analysis. 
So uh, this was the application for the human CD8 T cells that we got from lung cancer individuals. Um, it was quite a big study. We took 53 different tumors. We had the, no the, the, lung, the adjacent lung tissue. We call it normal, but it's not normal. It's from the same patient, okay? And it's not infiltrated by, by the tumor. So it's away from the tumor. And we had also the peripheral blood. We dissected it to, uh, to a single cell, uh, and, uh, and then we, we run uh, our panel. And in this case, we didn't analyze the data in the standard way anymore. So we, uh, uh, we don't do like CD4, CD8, and then uh, a naive memory, et cetera, et cetera. Well, we just take the CD8 data as a bulk, and then uh, put them into this, uh, uh, analyze them by this algorithm. So we don't make any assumption on the single cell data. So we run phenograph, and the way we did this, we took 3,000 cells per sample. We took all the samples, 3,000 cells per sample, so more than 100 samples, half a million cells. We concatenated all the data, so they go all together into a single huge file. And then we analyze, uh, we analyze these data. Obviously, every sample is barcoded. So then afterwards, you can debarcode and see uh, 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 what, wh uh, where the cells come from. So you, you run this, and then we do all kinds of different visualization uh, 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 approaches to, to see our data. So you end up with a, made, with, with a heat map like this. Okay? So this is a heat map uh, and, uh, where you have the antigen in, in the columns and the different clusters, so the putative populations that this algorithm identifies. Okay, and then you do a meta clustering, so you can uh, uh, you can cluster these antigens and the populations again, so they're they're brought together uh, populations or markers that have the similar phenotype, so it helps you uh, follow uh, the data. So, for example, um, so this is this is the heat map. The color code of your obviously is the brighter the blue, the the more that antigen is expressed. We have these balloons here from the different. Uh, uh, from the different tissues, it gives you an idea of the abundance of that population from every single site. And this is just the statistics. So, for example, if we go, let's skip that. Uh, if we go through these data, these populations here, these two populations here, what, cluster 1 and 3, they have very high value, uh, levels of CD73, CCL 727, and they also express CD45 RA. And that phenotype coincides with what we call naive cells. Okay, so cells that, uh, that have never seen the antigen. And they're highly abundant or re relatively abundant in the peripheral blood, and you don't see them in the tumors, or there's very few naive cells in the tumor. Okay, not very surprising if we know that. Um, these are subsets of different flavors of activated and exhausted cells. Okay, so activated because they have high 67 or they have HLADR, high levels of HLADR. And then you can follow, you can try to see what, what you have in these populations. So, for example, like this one, it's very abundant in, in the tumor, but you don't see it in the peripheral blood as high levels of TIM3. TIM3 is an exhaustive marker, and it's a target of cancer immunotherapy. The clinical trial is now trying to block TIM3 and see if it, if it induces an anti-tumor immune response. So this population you only find in the, in the, in the tumor. And then we have uh, senescent cells uh, or killer cells. Uh, these cells are generally terminally differentiated by, by very good killers, as I, as I told you in the very beginning. They have CD57, they have uh, high levels of TBAT, uh, transcription factor modulating uh, uh, the effector function of, of cells, um, and, and, and different levels of, 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 also of other molecules. Uh, which, are, which are abundant in the peripheral blood, and, and you see them in the lung, in the normal lung, but you, have, and you don't have them in the tumor, so ideally the tumor excludes those cells from, from the microenvironment. And I, again, they're good killers. Different memory flavors, we're not going to go through that, but uh, what I want to discuss today in, in, in the last 5-10 minutes is this population here, CXCR5 positive memory cells. So these cells have high levels of CXCR3 and CXCR5, and uh, especially this population, cluster 17, is, is not found in the peripheral blood, but it rel it's relatively abundant in, in the tumor. So we started uh, studying uh, those cells. And they look like effector cells. So the other thing that they have is that they, they express eons and they express CD95, so they're memory cells. So when we were doing, uh, oh, the other thing is that they have, uh, especially this population, it has uh, some CD69 expression. So CD69 is a marker for tissue retention 
and ideally uh, it's a tissue resident memory population, so something not coming from the circulation but present in, 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 in situ. So when we, do, uh, when we were phenotyping these cells, a number of papers came out actually on, on this topic. Uh, uh, this is from chronic viral infections, uh, so LCMB infection or, uh, acute, uh, or uh, chronic HIV. So what uh, these, these papers uh, have shown is that there is a CXR5 positive CD8 T cell population in lymphoid tissues in mice or in humans, which has these characteristics. So it's PD-1 intermediate, so it has some level of exhaustion. Uh, but at the same time, it maintains features of memory cells. In particular, um, a transcription factor called PCF1, T cell factor 1, uh, which is important for the long-term persistence of, of the cells. And these cells at the same time have a T3 negative phenotype, so they're not fully exhausted, and they are, they're also Tbet negative, but they express eons. So we wanted to have a better idea of, of these cells. So we can measure many markers, but that's not uh, uh, comparable to what you can do with single cell RNA sequencing. In that case, you can measure thousands of different genes at the level of every single cell. So this is not an experiment that we did, but we took this data set from, uh, from this paper in Science. There's about nine, uh, so where they characterize the single cells, uh, immu single immune cells from people with metastatic melanoma. So there's about 900 CD8 cells in that data set, and 58 of them express CXR5. So we, uh, we, we, we took uh, the different populations uh, uh, characterized by CXR5 and, and, and TIM3 expression. So here you have uh, uh, the CXR5 single positive and the double negative and the single positive for TIM3 in the mouse. You don't have this one, so we additionally characterize that population. So if you do an in silico sorting for these three cells, uh, these three subsets, and then you look at the differential expressed genes, you see that this population has increased levels of genes related to memory cells. So you have CXR5 itself, of course, and TCF7, which encodes uh, TCF1. TCF1 is the protein, TCF7 is the mRNA. And then you have memory genes such as CD28 and, and, and SLAMF7, BCL6. Instead, the, double, uh, the, the, the single positive T3 population has a lot of genes involved in T-cell exhaustion and dysfunctionality. So you have a T3, PRDN1, PD1, high levels of PD1. Uh, lag free and so on and, and so forth. And uh, um, we also did additional analysis to demonstrate that, because that was done in the mice, uh, that actually the, the CXR5 positive population has a follicular uh, identity. So if you take a gene set from the follicular helper cells and then you do a gene set enrichment analysis, and basically you look at the differential expressed genes and you test if those genes are also present in your population, that's highly significant. And at the same time, these cells here, the CXR5 positive, but not the TIM3 positive, which are present in, they're both pre present in the tumors, these, they, they look much more uh, uh, like naive cells and not the, the uh, um, uh, effector cells. So this is just a different way to show the, the, uh, the single cell RNA sequencing data. If you, if you have a look at the transcription factors, effector molecules, etc. This analysis, it's done at the level of single cells, and it shows that this population, which is in purple here, uh, it has uh, some levels of exhaustion because you have PD-1 and you have TIGIT, which is another molecule involved in, in exhaustion. But you don't have LAG-3, you, know, you have very low levels of CTLA-4. So they're partially exhausted. They're found in the tumors. They're partially exhausted. But at the same time, they, 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 they're still functional because if you look at the levels of some cytotoxic molecules, like granzyme, uh, perforin, they're present. Uh, so they're, they're, they actually have the, the possibility to kill. So they're partially exhausted, but still with the possibility uh, to kill. And they have memory properties because you, you find all the genes that you generally find in memory cells. So PCF7, EMS, has some levels of BCL6, but not much uh, BLIMP1, and, and you have FOXO1 uh, overexpressed. So uh, the, the, the experiments in mice suggested that this population was a stem light. So even though partially exhausted, it was capable to self-renew and at the same time to differentiate into a, a more differentiated uh, progeny. So we wanted to test this in vitro. And uh, uh, 
what we did is was to set up a couple of assays for testing multipotency, so the capability of the cells to generate more differentiated cells, and also self-renewal, so the capability of the cells to maintain themselves, maintain the original phenotype. And you can do this by, by stimulating with two different uh, cocktails of, of, of stimuli. So for multipotency, we just do a CD328, so a TCR, T cell receptor dependent stimulus plus cytokines. And for self renewal, only IL 15 for 10 days, okay? Because the cells proliferate, but they ideally they don't differentiate in response to that stimulus. And this was uh, just a proliferative, uh, the proliferative capability of these cells. And you can see that if you take the CXCR5 positive, uh, the, the, those cells proliferate just fine. Instead, the team 3 positive, which are the exhausted ones, they don't do that very well in response to both stimuli. <laughs> And, uh, and this is the multipotency assay, and this is a self-renewal assay. So if you take the, the three different populations and then stimulate with CD328 plus cytokines, this is the different progeny that they can generate. So you see here that this population here can generate all kinds of combinations of antigen expression. Instead, if you move towards what we think is more differentiated cells, you have uh, less uh, capability of doing so. Instead, if you stimulate with IL-15, which should drive mainly self-renewal, this population here is highly capable of maintaining the original phenotype, and instead the other ones mainly maintain themselves, but they don't go back in generating the CXCR5 positive cells. And finally, we wanted to see if this population was more abundant in, uh, in, in, in patients who was protected for, 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 for prognosis, um, a, a parameter that we like very much is called SUV max. So it's, a, it's an indication of the glycolytic capacity of the tumor. So all our patients uh, undergo a PET scan before they do the surgery, and the PET scan gives you the idea of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of how much the tumor is aggressive. And uh, if, you, if you take those values and divide between the stage of the international classification, you see that, that people with stage one, so with uh, a, a low progression, they have low levels of this parameter. And then if you, if you take stage two and stage three, they're, they're kind of similar. So we divided between stage one and stage two and three. So if you look at this cluster, this population here, it's more abundant in, in people with low values, low uh, super values, so that means less aggressive tumors, so it's kind of associated with protection. And, uh, and uh, the same goes if you divide between the stage. So stage one and the more advanced stage, you have the same, the same trend. So um, um, uh, what is, uh, sorry, we're, we're going to skip this. So what we have basically in tumors is, uh, is this kind of thing. So we have three stages of differentiation. And uh, just, uh, just uh, taking this, this, this uh, painting by Gustav Klimt, the three ages, we have a very young cells, CXR5 positive, that we call stem-like, which are capable upon stimulation to generate defectors, so the, the, the good killers, and upon uh, chronic stimulation, also the team 3 positive exhausted ones which are, are abundant, they can, they can persist, they're there, they don't die, but they don't kill very well, okay? And uh, uh, so after we published this paper, uh, uh, a bunch of other papers came out to, uh, uh, that demonstrated that actually this population expressing either CXR5 or TCF7 is actually the best responder to anti-PD-1, and this was done both in humans and, and in mice, especially this, this, uh, this, this paper by, by people from the Broad Institute where they found that the very good responders to PD-1 had increased levels of, of B cells compared to the, to the non-responders, which instead had higher values of, of the thing 3 positive. So basically, if we want to place this into the differentiation uh, scheme in the tumor, we have this population here that has this phenotype. We don't know if they come from naive cells or from memory cells. We're studying that. But upon anti-PD-1, they, they proliferate very much and they generate the exhausted cells. So this, is, uh, uh, this was my last slide, and uh, let me thank all the people involved in this, uh, especially uh, Georgia and Yolanda, who did all the experiments in the tumors, Emilia and, and Simona, who did all the bioinformatics uh, analysis, and then all the, all the, uh, the, the funding. Um, uh, we're recruiting, so if you're interested in a, in a fellowship uh, uh, we, we, um, for, for hunting for new subsets, you know, drop me a line. I'll be happy to, to talk to you.
Okay, thanks very much.